Everything works on time, right? <laughs> or anybody thought about you know streaming games or virtualizing you know GPUs? Uh, I've done networks for quite a long time. Actually, you know, going back, um, one of uh, my first jobs in the U.S. was uh, at a small organization called uh, UUNet, uh, where literally, I think, you know, in internet was uh, was built and invented. I uh, started my career actually in in uh, security. I was in the military, and I got to do a lot of uh, fun projects around networks and uh, IT with cybersecurity in mind uh, you know, not 30 years ago. Uh, yeah, been a, no. a wild ride. Uh, a lot changed, uh, yeah. a lot stayed the same, and I completely yeah. agree that, uh, you know, we keep on going uh, in circles, uh, which maybe the, the, the most fun is being, you know, what we consider cloud, and do you do everything on the edge unit, or do you do everything in central data center? Um, and I think we went back and forth at least uh, four times um, <laughs> during my career. Uh, and now with, you know, edge computing, after all this discussion about everything is going to be, quote unquote, in the cloud, yeah. uh, edge is going everywhere. And, you know, we'll, oh, we'll go to cloud that was, cycle. Again. Cloud was going everywhere in the last five years. So that, that brings us to maybe the, the, the core topic of today's webcast cost, right? And I was just thinking about, I was around for a long time too. By the way, my name is Kamesh Pemaraju. I forgot to introduce myself. I'm the host and moderator for this webcast. I run marketing here at, uh, at Platform 9. Been here for five years, almost five years. And I enjoy the ride too. But I was just thinking back to the last recession, right? Which happened back in 2008. And cloud wasn't even here at the time. I think AWS just came out with their first EC2 instances around that time, or maybe a little earlier. But think back the last 15 years, you know, it was it was an amazing ride for the cloud guys, right? Everybody went in there. Amazon to AWS today has $80 billion in revenue. And now today, and Howard, this is really for you to dig in and help us understand. You know, cloud's taken off. There's there's a lot of pressure today on on cost, and we keep hearing this. I'm hearing it at least, and I, I think maybe Ron is also hearing from his conversations with prospects and customers. People are rethinking, or at least thinking about cost optimization in the cloud, right? Which makes sense because the, yeah. when there's a lot of pressure. People are like, oh, you know, how do I reduce my cost? How do I optimize my cost? But my question is, there is still on-prem infrastructure, a ton of it. <laughs> right? Uh, is repatriation from the public cloud real? Is it happening now? Absolutely. It's absolutely happening. Um, I yeah. think there's, you know, we see a lot of customers that are on cloud strategy version four, cloud strategy version five. Um, most of the time when I see that, uh, it's because they, they went to cloud with the wrong things in mind, right? Um, the cloud solve, the, the cloud gives you two advantages. Um, both are capability advantages. The first is um, migrating to the cloud is supposed to be, the most of the effort is supposed to be around reducing your technical debt, right? Undoing those changes that have lingered in your environment for 10, 12, 15 years that are no longer efficient or effective or were made because they were the best you could do at the time. The second is agility. I can turn up a new service in the cloud um, like I'm sending an email. I realize it's not that easy, but it is in fact that fast. Um, I can't do that on-prem, procurement takes time. Procurement in the cloud is nearly instantaneous. Those are the two benefits we're supposed to get from cloud and turning those into capabilities and building our IT operating model around that kind of dynamic is what we are supposed to do. So many companies went into the cloud thinking they were going to save money and not focusing on those two things. If you focused on those two things, the potential to save money was absolutely there. You didn't focus on those two things. You didn't modernize your applications. You did a lift and shift. You expose yourself to all kinds of dangers and it costs you a lot more money. It is far more expensive to run your data center the same way in the cloud as it is on-prem for the most part. Mm -hmm. So we're absolutely seeing a lot of repatriation, we're seeing a lot of companies that didn't change their operating models, that didn't really learn to be cloud native, that found and got bit by the, that lift and shift and really never took advantage of the agility. 
And if you don't do those things, yeah, it's it's the, the economics are far better to run it on prem. And and likely you didn't lay off all the people that knew how to run the hardware. You simply mm-hmm. added cloud to them. So bringing it back on prem, they still know how to run the hardware. I didn't I didn't give up that capability. Right. So I'm not suddenly having to rehire a bunch of people that I let go because I likely didn't let them go. I just I just right. retrained them. Um, and so we're seeing a ton of repatriation. So are we looking at a uh, lift and shift 2.0 back to on-prem? Is, uh, that, is that real? Is that happening? I think we I think we kind of are. Um, mm-hmm. Smart organizations, though, are saying, what did we what did we, in fact, learn from the cloud? If the cloud isn't um, this utopia of everything always, all the time, easy to run, blah, blah, blah. And we're actually, we have that comfort with on-prem and we can have some cost savings with on-prem. What did we learn from the cloud and how can we pull that back on-prem? The goal really was never for you not to have some on-prem. The goal was that your on-prem infrastructure would start to resemble and act like a cloud, just a cloud that you ran. You'd still address it as though it was kind of cloudy. Um, So what did we learn there? Right. What did what did we what did we learn in the cloud that we can now take advantage of on prem? And that's I think really where the focus needs to be. Great answer, uh, Ron. You want to add maybe, uh, yeah. maybe a, a sub bullet to you know the agility uh, topic that, that Howard mentioned, which part of it was actually just usage and and how how much capacity you you might need for your workloads. Uh, the the big downside that people saw in you know, buying hardware for on-premise uh, was that obviously you have to plan, you know, your infrastructure for essentially the worst minute of the year. Yeah. Uh, and the dream was, well, when we move to cloud and we have all these agility, uh, we don't need to do that anymore, right? I mean, you know, we can run at the bare minimum amount of resources and then just scale uh, automatically, you know, up and back down when necessary. And you know, as Howard mentioned, I mean, the, the problem is soon as somebody, you know, starts a project with the label of lift and shift, uh, obviously all the tooling and the software itself that is required to be able to do that is gone. And because public cloud was considered new, a lot of, you know, the IT folks took buffers to make sure that, you know, they had even more headroom uh, in, in place in order to not risk these workloads at that, you know, worst minute. So overall, I mean, look, looking back, and I know it's always easy, you know, it, it should have been pretty obvious that it's going to end up being, you know, more expensive because, well, you you get more. Somebody is managing your infrastructure for you, right? I mean, you you it's not exactly apples to apples, and you don't take care uh, even of your own software to to get any of the benefits uh, that you that you intend to. Thinking mm-hmm. back. Okay, like three, four, five years ago when, when they started, I think many saw public cloud as an augmentation tool, yeah, not as an exclusive tool, meaning hybrid where you run, you know, most of your workloads on your own infrastructure, and then you burst into public cloud to not re- not have the requirement to buy uh, all the hardware that you would ever need on day one. And then on top of that, right, because you have this agility, dev teams can, you know, go in and do experiments and and and, and activate infrastructure they don't have in their own data center very quickly. But at some point, it just stayed there, right? Instead of like being this experimental thing, they just stayed and expanded and expanded and nothing ever got turned off. And I talked to many, many friends that, you know, went in with like really well intentions only to find out that they, they actually haven't utilized all the planned benefits. They, they just went there fast because it was possible. But that second phase of, of optimizing never came. And I think it was in part the, the fault of, you know, the good economic times. Yeah, I mean... You, you don't think about fundamentals, right? Like exactly how much margin, what are the cogs, how many people you have doing what, when it's the good times, right? Because it's the good times. As soon well, as things, yeah. yeah. I think I think to that point, um, it's also kind of green money versus brown money. It's always how I thought of it. Brown money is what I use to run what's already there. Green money is what I use to invest in new things. And if, yeah. if last week's development project that rushed into production before being finally tuned was seen as a success, the business immediately goes, cool, what else can you do? 
right? That's and right. so so that period of money is tight. I don't have enough green money to continue to invest in new things. And therefore, I'm trying to make my brown money far more efficient, right? My brown money needs to spend as $2. My green money needs to spend as 50 cents or 30 cents, right? Um, instead of doing the the efficiency, the optimization that I would have done when money was tight, kind of to your point, I just went to the next project. I just went to the next thing and I delivered that and then I delivered that and then I delivered that. And, and that's why the second money becomes hard to get again. Money becomes expensive. My green budget shrinks and everybody goes, holy yeah. crap, have you looked at how much IT is spending now? Um, they immediately went, uh, we now need to, uh, we now need to claw all this back. Yeah, and that brings us to the to the main question, I guess, Howard, is take your brown money, right? Um, and try to quote unquote optimize or figure out how to save it. Because here's the thing, no matter what you do, innovation, growth, new green stuff is the engine of competitiveness, is the engine of innovation, is that's how you grow, that's how you get better in the market. So people are not going to sit back and say, you know what, I'm not going to do any innovation. I don't know. I'm asking you this question. Is that happening now? Um, I, I'm sure it is. Uh, it's a bad idea, but uh, but I'm sure it is, right? Um, yeah. Investment funds have, we're, we're seeing investment funds shrinking within organizations. We're seeing data teams and and kind of data projects shrinking within companies. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're seeing those things that should have had an ROI that no one ever looked at, right? We, we all look at the ROI when the project is proposed. We don't always look at the ROI after the project's done and go, did we actually achieve what we say we were going to achieve for an ROI? Right? Again, we just kind of move on to the next thing. And now, now we've got people going back and looking, going, hey, wait a minute. We were told we were going to get all these benefits. We really didn't get all these benefits. Why not? And so we're seeing budget clawback, we're seeing a lot of budget clawback, um, which is really changing kind of the, the brown and green economics. Um, we're being told we have to, once again, do more with less. So our brown budget's yeah. going shrinking and our green budget budget uh, uh it feels like it was you know the field of dreams um now it feels like a welcome mat of green right i used to have a whole baseball field and i could staff a whole team now it feels like a welcome mat in front of the door not quite enough to get anything done right so which which you're... brings begs the question how do you optimize right how do you optimize the spend <laughs> um well i think there's another dynamic there um, and this is this is something that that as an industry we do because um, it's not just um, the buyer that suffers this shrinkage in budget, but it's also the seller organizations suffer. Right, the tech companies themselves are now being told to do more with less. It's unlikely we're going to get new logos. We need to stretch the logos we have. Right, um, and publicly traded companies. Right, um, you you either uh, increase your revenue or or uh, the stock market starts to lose faith in you. Um, and so not only has has as a buyer has my my brown budget shrunk, right? Um, and my green budget just about completely gone away. But at the same time, but at the same time, um, everybody's now showing up with their hands out. And I'm seeing a lot of companies showing up going, um, hey, that thing that you did that you liked so much, um, that thing has now become 10, 15, 20, 25 percent more expensive. Be prepared for a big adjustment in your in your contract costs when you go to renew this year. Um, and so it's kind of a, you know you're kind of being hit by both sides. And so now is a really good time to really take a look at that and go, hey, how can we optimize? How can I take my one dollar and spend it as though it was two? How can mm -hmm. I leverage those decisions? And it's really, really hard to leverage an existing relationship and go, hey, we're going to renegotiate in my favor. It's often just like it's easier to get a raise by going to a new job. It's often easier to get a, a better value for your dollar by bringing a new logo into your organization. Okay. John, you were going to say something. Yeah. I just wanted to add that, the, I mean, one, one, uh, one thing to consider and, you know, it, it touches the, the definition of the word innovation. I, I like these type of words that mean so many different things to different people. Uh, but, you know, if, if you go to engineering leadership and you say, well, you know, th there is no more, you know, green budget, uh, but any dollar that you can save from the brown budget, you can use for new stuff. You can essentially use it for whatever you want. I think that we will see quite, and we do see quite a lot of innovation in how to convert brown money to green money. 
Uh, and that includes uh, a series of, of actions starting from simply, you know, optimizing the, the types of services that you would use, how you would use them, re-optimizing the code that you wrote two years ago to maybe not require, you know, all these resources, making sure that their DevOps team actually have the mandate to go and measure whether you're using what you claim you will be using, because maybe you can just, you know, reserve less. Uh, and, and on top of that, things that actually run at capacity more than a few hours a day, which, you know, is kind of like the, the, the breaking point, move back, right? And, and, and pay for that hardware, you know, monetize it over five years, right? Capitalize it and get some saving by doing that. Now, some organizations, you know, start with this you know, obvious objection of like, well, I mean, I, I got a whole bunch of, you know, include the things, you know, that touch my operation. So how can I, you know, deal with that? But fine, you know, that there are many, many ways to, you know, to to go back and either relearn and reutilize tools that solve those issues. But all of a sudden, you know, you 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 have innovation on both fronts, right? You have innovation in how to really optimize your workloads to do more with less and leftover money to create some uh, activity for 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 new capabilities, and I agree with Howard that I mean that the, the most risky thing that can happen is that all of a sudden because there is no new budget, yeah, the risk of like not innovating and staying ahead and competitive will stop. On the infrastructure side, right? So you mentioned DevOps and optimizing workloads. Sure, that's one aspect of it. The other aspect is infrastructure itself. If I'm all in on a public cloud, we started this conversation with repatriation, right? Our, so if you bring it back on-prem, right, there is A, the migration issue. What does it take? How risky is it? How long will it take? How much will it cost? How feasible is that, number one? Number two, if I end up doing the repatriation, am I going to save any money? How would you answer that question? So um, I want to make one comment on what Rob was saying, because I think I think the innovation is really, really cool. Um, I, I'm always excited when money is free. Yeah, right? we went through five years, six years, seven years where money was free. Right. Um, yes. It's always fun because it's a little bit of the wild, wild west. I want to try something. I have the budget. I go do it. I want to try something. I go do it. I want to try something. I go do it. I do my absolute best to align it to the overall business goals. You're in front of the COO, the CEO, the chief of product that, you know, that the head of manufacturing and the board like crazy um, to the point where they get tired of hearing from you. Uh, I'm somewhat more excited about the innovation that happens when the green money goes away. Because mm -hmm. when the green money goes away and you're just told to do more with less, I'm not in front of the board all the time. I'm not in front of the COO all the time. I'm not expected to deliver new features and capabilities to the business. And what I can really focus on, so, so when green money is free, my focus is faster. That's, that's my focus. When when green money isn't free and I'm focused on getting the most from my brown budget, my focus now is not on being faster, but I'm being better. And that is a fantastic place to be with the right attitude, right? I'm not being asked to do a thousand new things, but I can really focus on doing the thousand things that I do better. And I can claw back all of those inefficiencies that I've lost. And then, like you said, right, I, I now have found money that I can do things with. And some of that found money, it's a great time to really look at what what is my data center? Do I really want to be in the data center business? Is it a good time to maybe outsource that that floor space, outsource that management, right? Use a data center provider. Um, since I've moved into the cloud, I've switched from a cap, capital budget to a, a CapEx to an OpEx model. Now that means I can start taking advantage of leasing. And let's be honest, a lot of the hardware providers today have gone to a consumption model. Right. And so I, I only really need to be concerned about buying my on prem the same way I buy in my cloud. Look, st I'm not storing less. I'm never storing less. So I know what my minimum storage is. There we go. Now I've started my minimum commit. Right. So I can start to get into these things less expensive. And because budgets are tight and because we're looking at repatriation, the ability to add a logo means I can throw, means the vendor will throw a PS at me. Right, so maybe I don't have the the number of people that I would need to do the migration, but if I augment that with what the the storage vendor will give me, uh, maybe now I do have the people, and they probably know the most efficient way to do it, and they probably know the most effective way to do it, and they'll probably set it up using modern, as in very up to date, best practices. 
Mm. Right. And so my risk starts to go down because I've got a partner involved and I've got a partner that doesn't want to make mistakes involved. Right. I'm getting the best advice I possibly could on that system in this time. Right. Um, and, and let's be honest, the tools are really good compared to 10 years ago. Oh yeah. Especially if we were an early adopter to cloud, like the pain we had moving into cloud is not going to be the pain we have moving out of cloud. The tools are really, 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 really good, extremely well documented. And I'm likely going to make my IT team feel comfortable because they've likely done this on-prem thing for most of their career, mm -hmm. right? So even they can kind of breathe a sigh of relief, like they're going back home. Right, right. Staying on-prem, uh, let's let's go back. So this is a great conversation about how we can optimize your on-prem infrastructure. Now, a lot of these companies, and without naming names, <laughs> are using quote-unquote legacy stacks, right? Whether that's virtualization, whether that's management stacks. And that, for the years, you know, that tax has been increasing, to say the least, right? Um, so, Howard, uh, how can... How can companies optimize those that I would say virtualization tax or license tax or whatever you want to call it? What well, are some alternatives available? Well, yeah, this is this is the thing that I love the most. Um, that's the lessons we should have learned from cloud if we're going to repatriate, right? All the stuff that runs in cloud, you can run yourself at home, right? Um, while the cloud invented a ton of things. Uh, so many things are released as open source and then commercialized thereafter mm -hmm. that create extremely well-supported, extremely manageable on-prem solutions that don't have the legacy tax that start to look more and more and more like cloud, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, don't, don't go back to monolithic application design. Build your Kubernetes infrastructure on-prem. Find a partner that works for you. Build your Kubernetes infrastructure on-prem. That, that looks and operates very cloud-like. And in many ways, let's be honest, the, the, the hyperscalers, they don't really have great Kubernetes management platforms. Mm -hmm. You probably wanted a third party anyhow. Right. So look, look for a third party that also manages on-prem the same way they manage in the cloud. Right. We're not talking about going to zero cloud. We're just talking about reducing the cloud for, and, and using cloud for those things that are important, like agility. Mm -hmm. Right. Agility is a really important use for cloud. I want that burstiness of cloud, the, the zero minute uh, procurement cycle of cloud. Well, if, if it's gonna stick around and it's an enduring workload, I don't need it to be bursty. Why would I pay the cloud tax? Let's pull it back on-prem, but make it look like cloud. Yeah. Speaking of Kubernetes, Teron, uh, I, mean, I mean, obviously it's become a de facto standard in the last, I don't know, eight years now. It's been around for a while, it's mature. And Platform 9, of course, does a lot of work with Kubernetes. But <laughs> Kubernetes is a container management solution, container orchestration solution. Now, you need to containerize your applications in order to take advantage of Kubernetes. But you've seen, and we have seen, and Howard, you were saying this last time we met, 90% of the workloads, or maybe more, are still in virtual machines. Right, Ron? You, you see this all the time when you talk to customers. Absolutely. So if how is it going to help me if I go to Kubernetes and I have all these virtual machines lying around? Well, I, I think um, first thing projects like uh, Kubevert were, were invented because the dream of everything would just get containerized right away started to fail, right? Just a few years ago. Uh, and since the, the, the baseline being KVM had been very, you know, well-known, stable, including in public cloud, as running VMs. It, it became very convenient okay, to, to create this facility of bringing VMs uh, into uh, the Kubernetes world. The reason, right, it, it makes sense is because the, the, the migration or the re-architecture into containers is not expected to stop. So can you be on a target platform that does all these things that you would like it to do, okay? Like intent-based orchestration earlier, and can you gain those benefits, the operational benefits of being on such platforms for your VM-based workload as well? Now, you know, in, in your previous question, you talked about, you know, bringing workloads back and how hard that might be. And then can you move away from legacy systems? And I think both can actually be combined. 
because the simplest thing that you can actually bring back from public cloud were all the lift and shift workloads that were basically taken from on-premise to public cloud with maybe an intent to optimize them, maybe not. And now when you know you have effectively a similar system, as Howard said, like something that was really born in the open source and got commercialized both, both as software as well as service, bring those back, okay? Learn how to utilize more modern tools that reduce the overhead, so save even more money by automation, and then right start going up the stack of things that are closer to true born in the cloud type of activities. So you reduce, you know, your your legacy tax for things that are still on premise. You reduce your cloud tax for things that you shifted to public cloud with some idea that it's going to save you money only to find out that it's more expensive. And you reduce operational costs, freeing people up to effectively start doing like a real innovation, utilizing tools and automation. And, you know, you, you have a triple win. Right. No, that's a that's an excellent idea there. Bringing back your... After all, what you did was lift and shift from your on-prem to public cloud. Now you just do the reverse, right? And you're immediately saving costs on public cloud um, uh, utilization. And, and, so, and were, but both, both on the software stack and the hardware stack, the, the mm -hmm. level of, of consumption-based services varies. Yeah, you, you, you can go completely back to your on-premise, right? Buy a server. That's one extreme, right? You went from mm -hmm. getting services is, is a service to owning your metal. And then there are all these other shades. You can go into Colo, you can go to a, a company that just rents you the server, you can go to a company that rents you a partial of the server. Right? Same thing with, with the software stack. If you are if you're a company that is kind of like a, a recent born in the cloud company and you're today using 20 services, you know, from somebody like AWS or GCP, Obviously, a complete move back to your private data center might be more difficult than, as we said, if you simply took your VM from A and you put it in B, and now you're looking to put it in A again. And there are many, many different shades. Now, most large companies, they have workloads in all these shades. You know, if I were them, right, I mean, I wouldn't recommend you start with the most difficult one. Yeah, maybe that should get its own product that optimizing the types of services they're using, but start going down the stack and then find the sweet spot of where the more you pull in, right, the more, you know, money you would effectively save and, you know, build a real ROI and actually go back every quarter and check whether you're, you know, getting the, the benefits that you plan to. Mm. One of the things, Howard, you said <laughs> earlier is, yes, there are tools now, very, very modern tools, and you're absolutely right. 10 years, we have seen a plethora of tooling that came from the open source community, the community, CNCF, all these are great examples. At the same time, I would argue that the number of tools is also exploded to the point where people are completely getting lost with which tool should I use? What is the right one that, that's good for my environment? So this brings up the question of the trade-off between trying to do everything yourself with your limited staff, there's still a challenge of skills in the marketplace. And maybe Howard, you can speak to this problem, but there is a trade-off between trying to do everything yourself versus trying to get expertise that you don't have. Can you talk to some of the trade-offs and pros and cons of one versus the other? And how, how should enterprises be thinking about this problem? Sure. So um, I, I, honestly, the way I lead this, the way I plan it, the way I strategize around it is exactly the same way as how I look to the thing in my background. I've owned 170 cars in my life. I love things with engines. Um, I currently have 18 vehicles, not 19, 19 vehicles. Um, I, I do most of the work myself. Mm -hmm. right? I'm very comfortable with a wrench and a ratchet. Hey, you had an exception, Howard. Uh, no, Nobody but, owns 18 cars that I know. <laughs> not that works. And, 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 but there's a point where I'm no longer comfortable working on the car, right? I don't understand the Bosch fuel injection on an air-cooled 911. I just don't. 
and I don't really want to take the time to learn. So when it gets to the point where I have to do something with the the fuel system on my 911, I go to a partner. I've got a I've got someone I can trust. I take my car there. It's my baby, right? They work on it. They treat me really well. Their pricing is reasonable and acceptable, but the quality of their work I can trust to the grave. I do the exact same thing when I'm planning my IT strategy. Hmm. The very first thing I would suggest you do in looking at repatriation, do an assessment of your of your in-house capabilities. What are you capable of doing and what are you comfortable in doing? Right? And how many of those passed the modern test? If we were really good at running SQL in 2005 or SQL 2000 and 2008, Maybe we don't decide to run our own SQL infrastructure, right? Maybe that becomes something we outsource to a third party because SQL 2019 is not the same thing, right? If we're really good at running VMware and, and ESX, maybe we don't want to run that ourselves because we've moved on beyond the basic capabilities of ESX, right? Maybe we, maybe, however, maybe we've got some really talented MongoDB folks right? We got some really talented storage people, right? Really do that assessment. Take the time to figure out what are you good at and what is current within those capabilities. Then I can start going, okay, well, these are the things I still need to solve, right? Just like building a car, I start crossing off the things I did, right? And now I go, okay, these are the partners I need to find. And the number one thing to look for isn't price. The number one thing to look for is trust, right? Price can be negotiated. You can't negotiate trust. Right. So find Absolutely. a partner you can trust that can that can do that. They can just take it off your plate. Mm -hmm. And then keep in mind every single thing that's taken off your plate frees up hours that you can focus on delivering value to your business. Running VMware doesn't give value to your business. Running your storage, running your databases doesn't give value to your business. What gives value to your business is enabling them to do work better, faster, get to answers faster, sell more products. No one, no partner will ever know your business. You know your business. So if you can free up people to be partners in the in the business, that's a second added benefit. And there really is no loss in this. There really is, you're not going to lose anything by making these decisions as long as you make them strategically with a plan and make them correctly. And it doesn't have to take forever. You can do that capability mapping in a month, right? You can start down the procurement path. Procurement's going to take you 90 days. Once you decide what you're doing, it's 90 days, right? While you're working with the vendors that that have a, you know, your hardware vendors that have that procurement cycle, do the exact same thing with the software providers. If you're outsourcing the work, if you're if you're buying a service that will manage some piece, it shouldn't take you more than 90 days to find them, get up to speed, figure out what you need and start that process. Right. right. We're not talking about a year long process. True. On the Kubernetes side, right, because since we brought up the modernizing the platform uh, notion earlier, and that's that's a challenge, right? There, there aren't that many Kubernetes expert, experts out there. Um, and, and you know, Ron, you, you've been talking to a bunch of customers. How do you, what, what are they saying about, about being able to leverage uh, expertise? you know, from a company like Platform 9, for example, versus doing it themselves? So I, I think maybe just before I, I react to that specifically, right? I think we need to take a step back to Howard's point, look at like what brings value to the business. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you're going to go through a process of, of bringing workloads back, you, you you for sure should not do it in the way it was done before. So it has to be more. And the very basic building block is how much more can we automate in order to not have to invest in you know, the time nor suffer consequences from infrastructure. Yeah? Infrastructure is a, is a supporting element to your business. So when you start there, you, you discover that many things that in the past were very, very difficult. Okay, how do you actually bring a new server online? Who does that? How long does how how long more time does it take beyond the person that racks and stacks it to get it to be functional? What happens when there is a firmware upgrade? What happens where when there is an OS upgrade? What happens when there is a Kubernetes upgrade or, or any other service, right? We talk about Kubernetes as it's the only thing, but it's just one 
of many things that will need to be installed to make the system functional. You can run a system without monitoring stacks, for example. Now, Kubernetes talent, you know, is hard to find. You know, a because it's new, and b because you know, maybe because it's new, it's changing rapidly. So, do you want to invest in that knowledge? For most organizations that are not in the business of infrastructure, the answer is probably not, right? And obviously for us, it's important because that's our business, but most of our customers, for them, it, it's an enablement capability among many, many others. But as you start looking at what does it take to actually take a workload and run it seamlessly and get the support you need with you know, live operations, not just supporting and helping them figure out problems afterwards, but figuring problems for them so there is no downtime. And I think that that's the only negative benefit, if that's a term, yeah? You, you cannot make more money, okay, by doing your own infrastructure, but you can definitely lose money if you don't do it well and you suffer downtime. So you need to for sure cover that angle, yeah? So automation, from hardware all the way up, getting the, as, as many building blocks to, to work together and out of the box as, as quickly as possible, be able to combine the old and the new. Yeah, so bring you know the, the VM workloads that for many organizations will stay forever. And for many organizations will continue to work in concert with the new workloads. More often than not, we see a situation where you know all the new capabilities, things that were invented in the past few years, started as containers. Very nice design, you know, auto scaling, shrunk to microservices, packaged in a way that can be deployed anywhere, et cetera, et cetera. But they have some backend, that they have some capability that was written 10 years ago. And, you know, people didn't have the money to go and refactor that up until now, now they definitely don't have the excess money to go and refactor it. It needs to continue to run in the VM. Can you bring up that VM? Can you expand and auto scale it with the same tool set that you use for the modern workloads? Well, the answer obviously is absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> have you thought about that you know, design? Not always. Why? Because the risk of just doing something as simple as let's just bring our workloads back. The risk is that you just take out, you know, the old, you know, uh, workbook that you had five years ago and say, okay, you know, I know how to do it. I'll just do it in the same exact way. You shouldn't do that, right? Mm -hmm. You should pause and say, well, I'll bring it back, but I'm sure that there are much, much better ways to do that. Can somebody like Platform 9 help me in at least figuring it out what that is? Well, and it can be done in a much, much more efficient way. Uh, I would also caution when you do, when you're going through all that work, um, it, uh, I run Kubernetes, like, a, like I'm a, I'm a talking head and I run Kubernetes at home. Um, Kubernetes is very easy to run. Download TrueNAS. They have a, they have Kubernetes built right in, they have containers built right in in a nice little management system. It's very easy. You can run it in your house. Running Kubernetes at scale is not running Kubernetes. Right. Right. Um, so many of these new technologies um, run really, really, really well in a lab and are relatively easy to get up and running in a lab and maintain in a lab. At scale, the complexity and the fragility really become apparent. And you know when you don't want to find that out? You don't want to find that out when you've turned on your 100th container or your 60th container. And then, hey, a big weekend pops and you've got to scale some component in there. And then you realize, oops, I've made a mistake. This is far more complex to do at scale. This is far more fragile because I really didn't know all the magic and magic and secret beans to it. Um, I probably should have someone. So, so get talk to a partner, even if you're not sure. Find someone you can trust, and, and they may tell you, look, you just you just if they're trusted, you just don't need us for this, right? You might even realize halfway through it, you don't need them for that. That's fine, but do the due diligence. Don't assume that you know how to do this. You'll be far, far better off. And, and I do. I recommend everyone um, find a platform. Unraid is great. 
right? TrueNAS is great. These are open source things. Well, not really, but they're they're low cost things you can run at home to get some experience with containers and really see for yourself what is you know what what is this? How does it work? How do stateful containers work? And get some feeling for the complexity because you don't want to make assumptions going into it. Um, only to find out when it's too late that um, that oops, this is not a place I could have made. I should have made a mistake. Right, and when things fail in production, uh, we like to say at two a.m. at night, <laughs> you're running ten thousand containers and something goes bump at two a.m. How are we going to deal with that? Right? How do you know where the problem is? Yeah, and you know and who, that you know requires real expertise, right? And you know when your best people are not sitting in in your knock and not yeah. sitting in the council at two a.m. their time. <laughs> right. Exactly. When they're sleeping peacefully. <laughs> That's exactly right. Uh, so and time for Q&A. It's, so, it's, so, it's so easy to fall into that trap, right? Because it's so easy, Howard, right? I mean, you know, the, to start is so easy. I mean, you, I, I talked to so many and just fell into like this sense of everything is okay, just because there were small, small changes that they had to do for working with their own workload until they went to production and things started scaling and problems they never experienced how to solve came up and then it's uh, it's a bit too late to do the learning. Yeah, yeah without a doubt. Yeah, yeah. so time for q and I'm seeing some questions come through here. Can you give some examples of case studies of companies that you're talking to or, or have worked in that have done some streamlining of their infrastructure and what are the, some of the key benefits they realized? It can either of you talk to this question? Maybe um, a case study or an example? Recently. I don't have any published case studies of the yeah. work done here recently. Yeah. Um, I have to think if I can find some uh, and put, I'll put them yeah. on, my, on my LinkedIn, see if I can make them available. Okay. Ron, you're talking to a bunch of people. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, we 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 see quite uh, quite a lot, and um, some can actually be downloaded from the website. So, commercial, I think you know maybe we should publish a, a link. Um, but, but you know, to, to give two examples, uh, one is kind of in a technology company that you know used to have a, a handful of, of nodes and grew to dozens of nodes, uh, and then grew to thousands of nodes. And where, where things prove to, to work well is that the fairly small size of their IT organization uh, did not need to change. And you know, when it did the first bump in, in capacity, it was already you know, proof enough. Uh, but now, kind of a few years in uh, with tremendous growth, I think it's clear that when you have enough automation and, and design of, of your infrastructure, uh, indeed you can you know rely on your partner uh, to to solve problems for you. Uh, the other, which goes a little bit in 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 a tangent, is what what happens with edges. And I know we're going to talk a lot about you know edge and what that means uh, in in upcoming events. Uh, but edge is really going. You know, pretty much, you know, everywhere. So we see kind of the, the two scaling dimensions. One is okay. You, you have your your private data centers. You might have a hybrid, but your fairly small number uh, of of locations that keep on growing in terms of nodes. Uh, but the other dimension, yeah, which happens primarily in retail, is when you know, you don't have a lot of nodes, so your workloads are very well optimized for literally a handful of nodes, but the number of locations uh, can grow to thousands and even tens of thousands. And if there is one thing, right, very, very few um, companies know how to deal with is that, right? Because even public cloud companies, you know, based their capabilities on the fact that they have a lot of users and a lot of uh, nodes in very, very few locations. And all of a sudden we find ourselves in a situation where you need to be able to ship a node everywhere and you need to get that node up and running uh, and monitored and have the latest and greatest software uh, on an ongoing basis in tens of thousands of locations. Uh, and we have you know, a, a very, very uh, nice uh, case study that that we put together on uh, how we you know are capable in enabling that and you know what kind of success that led to 
uh, with, with customers relying on that infrastructure. Right. There's another question that's just come in. Uh, I am surprised that there is low adoption of Kubernetes. Low adoption of Kubernetes hopeless, hopefully doesn't mean the same for microservices, I guess. Does this mean that companies are using microservices based on VMs? I'm not sure I understand this question. Um, and do you care to answer this? I think, I think, I think it's possible. I mean, for, yeah. first, maybe, I mean, to, to, to prefix, I mean, low is a relative term. Yeah, okay. we, we have, you know, 20 years of VMs, right? And yeah. a few years of, of Kubernetes. So mm -hmm. it's not exactly comparing apples to apples. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I do think that, you know, doing your design of your software uh, and then using containers and then using, you know, Kubernetes to orchestrate those containers uh, can be done separately. Yeah. And, and maybe it's even more powerful to actually change the actual architecture of your software, even if at the beginning, you know, you're, you're growing and, and auto scaling inside the ends. Than to, to then to do the opposite, which I've seen quite a lot, where you take your monolith, you know, uh, application that's the humongous thing running in a VM, and you wrap this continue. thing in a container, right? And you put the checkbox and saying, okay, I'm I'm containerized, right? And then you know you create a little account chart to deploy it, and you say, okay, automated. Yeah, no, <laughs> you, you you will not get the, the benefits in the long term. So, so it is possible and actually recommended that if you're actually serious about refactoring your application, you'll start with, with the basics and, and Kubernetes can come later. Yeah. What's and your thought? Sorry, 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 Kamesh, to, to plug a little bit, but yeah. obviously yeah. if you yeah. are running on platform nine and you do that with Kubeword in the VM, then the migration then to a tree container and truly using Kubernetes is going to be very very simple because you know it's the same system right you just you know use a different pod as opposed to the vm pod so this is Sorry, where no. the vm is running inside a pod so that so everyone understands what kubevert is it's it's basically a, a kubernetes pod but you're running a vm inside that pod so from an operating perspective you you're still getting all of the benefits of kubernetes resilience scale automation ha and all of that stuff but you continue to run your traditional VMs, right? Uh, Howard, on this question on low adoption of Kubernetes, I know it's, you know, Ron is yeah. right, it's relative, right? But what what are you seeing in the market? Well, well, <clears throat> um, I, I think it, it, it depends on what you mean by low adoption, right? Mm -hmm. um, I see an incredibly high adoption as, as in percentage of enterprises that have adopted Kubernetes in some way or mm -hmm. containers in some way, let's say. Yeah. Um, However, percentage of workloads on containers um, first is is a very hard metric to actually come up with because um, what we viewed as a traditional workload is now broken out into um, the smallest possible component that can run independently, um, linked with a whole bunch of other things so that a smallest component that can run independently. And so it becomes a lot harder to put together what do we mean by an application when we're running under Kubernetes. Um, but so much of our traditional enterprise workloads rely on third-party software. They rely on ISVs. Um, and that third-party software, the software that I don't own, uh, likely isn't containerized and likely still has to run on a VM, right? And so as a percentage of my total workload, if I've got 5,000 applications, I may only own kind of 50 of those workloads, <clears throat> which means 10% of my of my actual IT kind of business infrastructure gets modernized and moved over to Kubernetes. Um, that does not mean that the that it's actually a small percentage. Um, that's a very large percentage of people that run Kubernetes um, right. or containerized workloads. Um, and, and we're just going to see it grow. We're not going to see it shrink. There's no right. estimation that fewer companies are going to support containers, but rather more and more and more. One more question. Most of our clients use hyperconverged infrastructure, HCI, many to bring the benefits of the cloud on-prem. Could you please contextualize and elaborate on optimal cloud native infrastructure strategies in that environment or in that ambit? Many thanks for organizing and delivering this great webinar. Um, yeah, so, so uh, HCI is great for workloads that scale compute and storage relatively similarly. Right. 
Um, they're not awesome for predominantly compute focused workloads because I'm having to buy compute paired with my, my storage. Um, don't in, in that it is a bad idea to say we're cloud only. It's a bad idea to say we're also HCI only, mm. right? You really need to think about what is the workload that you're trying to run and where is it best to run it, right? What are the parameters? Um, is this a relatively traditional monolithic application that has a high resilient, high reliance on storage as well as compute? And I don't want to pull the pieces that require compute away from the pieces that have storage and the distance to the data is important. That's the big value of HCI, right? The distance to the data is very, very close, in which case HCI is great, right? Is this an application that has a bunch of web servers that talk back to one or more database servers that link data together? That don't that that don't need all that. Well, then I probably need some sort of hybrid that I can run on, right? Where I've got where I've got tight storage for my databases, but I don't really want my web servers running on HCI, right? So I really need to think about my environment. In can my environment support the applications that are reasonable for my um, for my business and do it in a way that makes logical sense, where the management overhead doesn't outweigh the the cost benefits of having the right um, the right space at the right time to run the right application. Perfect. We're almost at time here. There's just one final question that's coming through. This is uh, regarding new workloads, such as AI ML workloads. Uh, is there, it, it, are people actually running any of those today in the current economic conditions or what's the, what's your prognosis on, on some of this new stuff, Howard? Oh, we're seeing tons of it. Um, okay. And we're seeing it on-prem and in the cloud, right? Um, the fact is GPUs are expensive. Yeah. And so the expense of a GPU may push you into the cloud. If I'm only running a, my GPU enabled workload for four hours a day, as an example, or seven days a month, then I'm not ever going to amortize. I'm never going to get the, the, the real value of my GPUs. The cloud's probably a good place to put that. But we're also seeing a lot of companies recognizing that if they combine all of, all of their AI and ML workloads, they're, they're not only use, fully utilizing one GPU, but they're fully utilizing seven, eight, nine, 10 GPUs. Now there are methods to pull those back on-prem to actually partition your GPUs across all those systems and, and grossly exceed the economics of doing that in the cloud. Um, and so there are benefits of doing it both places. Again, right, right workload, right assessment, right place, right time. Yeah, a few and more I, questions. I agree that GPUs yeah. are expensive, but GPUs in the cloud, are crazy expense. <laughs> and they're not available, by the way. <laughs> right. They're not always available. They're not always available in all regions. So you're kind of stuck with that, that issue. So, so all the, right. the key that we keep on coming back to is that look at the workload, look at the usage, and, and make sure that you actually optimize for that particular workload. Don't just right. assume that you know one yeah. thing would be the answer. Yeah. Fantastic. I think we're at time. Uh, Awesome conversation, guys. This was really good. And Howard, I'll I'll take up um, with you on another webinar on your car stuff. It's really <laughs> fascinating. I I nineteen cars. I mean, where do you even put them? <laughs> uh, I, I have offsite storage locations that I keep okay. that I keep them in, and I rotate them. That's amazing. Well, thank you very much. There are a few other questions that have come through, but we are we're out of time. Uh, but really info informative. We're getting some good good feedback on the on the chat channel here. Thank you for your time and your experience and and knowledge here. Appreciate it. And everybody will get a copy of the recording if you missed it, or if you didn't have a chance to, to see it today, or or you want to catch up uh, later on your own time. Thank you so much, Howard uh, and don't Rob. A, don't you have another session coming up that people can join? Oh, yeah, you're right. I mean, if people want to check out the, the this whole cute word thing that Ron was talking about, uh, we will send you a, a separate session invite for you to join and see this whole thing in action. This is real. It's working at scale, and it's it's being proven in production. So come and join us then, and we'll show you uh, what's happening in the real world. Talk to you guys later. Have a great rest of the week. We'll catch up. Thanks, Take care, guys. Robert. Take mm -hmm. care, Ron. Bye.